All right. Okay, so I'll, I'll preach this morning. I do want to sort of touch on Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Um, if you don't know already, I don't really make a big deal of um, different holidays and things like that. So sorry if I don't make it a big deal in church. But hey, I'm, I'm happy for somebody to make it a big deal if somebody wants, you know, because you know, in some churches, people will have Mother's Day gifts and things like that. Hey, if somebody wants to organize something like that, I'm open to do it. But uh, yeah, I guess I just, I, to me, I, I'm not really just so big on um, the special events and things like that. So um, not that I'm against them. Maybe Elizabeth would want me to make it a bigger deal. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of Mother's Day, um, you know, I could say that, you know, it's not a sin, you know, whether or not you do or don't. You know, it's the same with uh, Christmas and Easter and other holidays. You know, some esteem one day more than another. Some esteem every day like uh, to each their own, I believe. That's my position on that. But, you know, Mother's Day, it's sometimes a sensitive time for people just because, you know, some, some ladies are struggling to have children. Some ladies can't have children. So sometimes Mother's Day is a reminder that, you know, oh, you know I wish I could be a mother. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's the right frame of mind to have because, you know, being a mother and having children, it's a valuable thing to do. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're not all equal and sometimes there are different situations in our life, different complications of why people can and can't have children. Um, whether it's relationship issues or what, but um, you know, it could be that somebody has lost a child or somebody has lost a mother and, and Mother's Day is, is sort of a sad reminder of uh, something that I guess most people would think of as a celebration, as something positive, ends up being something negative for them. Now, whilst I believe compassion is required, you know, we ought to feel compassion for people that are in those situations I don't think it's a reason to stop others from celebrating or honoring their mothers on Mother's Day. It, you know, it, it's, it, it's sort of like Christmas, you know, like sometimes Christmas becomes about the children. But if you can't have children, you know, should you stop everyone else from celebrating Christmas and having a family event just because you, you do not have the family that somebody else has? So whilst I feel for these people and I feel it's a, it's a sorrowful thing, these people that are in these situations should not feel they have the right to hinder other people from celebrating on days like today. Because I remember reading an article, and it's the same with Mother's Day and Father's Day, where somebody was complaining about churches having a Mother's Day service or having a Father's Day service and honoring mothers because, you know, do, do they not know how hard it is for people to, uh, who don't have children, who have lost their mother or in that situation? But, you know, we have to, you have to realize that, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. You know, the world does just, you know, doesn't, just because somebody celebrates something doesn't mean they're just doing it to stick it in your face, you know. So, you know, people are sometimes critical of uh, Mother's Day, uh, church services. And, you know, it's fine to have an opinion, but that doesn't mean the world has to revolve around your emotions. And this is, this is where the world has gotten to, where people have this frame of mind that the world owes them a favor, that the world has to revolve around how they feel. Um, and this is why, you know, you have teenagers now needing their safe space, that everyone's worried about what offends, political correctness, because er, the, the mindset these days is the world ought to serve me. You know, hey, I'm sad, so the world should cheer me up, rather than me, uh, Figure, you know, figuring out what does upset me, doesn't need to upset me. You know, is it about me? You know, why can't it be about somebody else? You know, why can't, it, why can't they have the frame of mind that other people want to be joyful? So I'm not going to let my pain and my sorrow hinder them from uh, celebrating on a day like today. So, you know, I understand that Mother's Day can be sensitive, but, you know, like I said, I don't think that should stop people from... Uh, being able to celebrate it and remember their mothers on, on a day like today. Now, 1 Timothy 5.14. I want to touch on this verse a bit. 1 Timothy 5.14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, this, this is not a popular verse in today's day and age. You know, a clear verse that says, this is the will of God for a young woman to marry bear children, guide the house. And this, this doctrine, this, this thought is under attack today as the world tries to encourage women to have a career and that's where you really get your worth is about you know, what else you accomplish other than children in life, how much you earn, how much praise you get from other people by doing things other than this. Um, but the Bible is very clear 
I mean, let's read it again. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So they're saying, if you do something other than this, you're giving the adversary occasion to speak reproachfully. So I think it's very important that we know this. And, uh, you know, this is not popular these days, but it's, it's funny that it's not, it's not even popular in some churches. You know, not only is it not popular in the world, it's not popular in, in sometimes fundamental, independent Baptist churches. Um, they don't like to hear this either, but it's, it's the Word of God. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because when I think back to when I was in university, I think back when I was in my youth group days, and how many times, you know, you go to youth group, and, you know, you have the topic of the will of God and you have all these young people, young ladies, just stressing over what to do with their life, thinking, what is the will of God in my life? And I remember the time when I actually came across this verse and I learned about it when I was a young Christian. And I just thought, do they not know this is in here? I mean, they, they, you've been wondering what the answer is to this question, what the will of God is for my life. And it's been in here all along, like spelled out, you know, at least... For, for a husband, you know, they have to think about, hey, what am I going to do for a job? And they've got that choice to make of different jobs that they could do. But here, it's, it's some, one thing that every woman can strive for. Um, so I just sort of thought, you know, why are they still wondering, you know, like what to do when the Bible says, hey, this is what you ought to seek to do as a, as a young lady. And to me, when I think of this, you know, if I was somebody struggling that decision and I had something as clear as this in the Bible, that would give me closure. That'd be like, great. I, I don't have to decide what's the most valuable thing to do in my life because I, I know now. It says here uh, uh, in, in, in plain English what God wants me to do with my life. So what is the will of God? What well, says here to marry, bear children and guide the house. So one is to be, it's to be a wife, it's to be a mother and it's to be a homekeeper. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't earn an income. You know, there are many people that work from home. You know, it might limit your choices, but it's about, it's about your priorities. It's about your responsibilities. You know, you need to be a mother first and a homekeeper. Uh, 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 you, you need to prioritize that. Um, that's what it's talking about. So, yeah, if, if somebody can squeeze in making a living on the side, then, hey, go ahead and do it. But then if your main responsibilities are being neglected, then you're not obeying this command here. So, you know, whilst it doesn't mean you can't have a job, it may, it may restrict the types of work that you can do. You know, if you, if you take on a job where you have to work 40 hours a week, you know, are you still keeping the home? I mean, if you have a, if you have a job that's very demanding, what happens when your boss wants you to do something, but your husband wants you to do something? Who are you going to obey now? So you need to consider these things when you think about earning a, a, an income as a mother, how it's going to affect your priorities and your responsibilities. You know, now, now you want to be a mother to your children, you know, for those of us who are married. Be a mother to your children. Don't be a mother to your husband. You know, your husband needs a wife. He doesn't need a mother. He's already got a mother. So the idea is you want to be a, a good mother to your children um, but you want to be a wife to your husband. So you want to think about, you know, how do you treat your husband? You know, for you ladies, and if, even for your ladies who are going to get married, you need to think about this as well. How do you treat your husband? Um, how do you talk to him? You know, do you respect his authority to make decisions or are you constantly undermining him? You know, how do you make him look in front of other people? So this is, this is what you need to consider when you relate to your husband but when you are relating to your children, you want to be a mother to them. Now, is this verse just talking about widows? Because somebody might say, well, this is just the will of God for widows because the context of this passage is about the church taking on widows that are over 60 years old and have, have done good works. So it's just the younger widows that God wants to marry, bear children and guide the house and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, it doesn't make sense to me that God would just have a will for people that have been married in the past. You know, if God is saying, hey, this is the will of God for uh, a person that's been married and her husband has died, why would that change for somebody who hasn't been married? You know, it'd be the same will for a young woman whether she's been married in the past or not. So I don't think this applies only to widows. And I think if we compare it to a couple of other verses, so if we go to Titus 2, 4, 
when we see here the exhortation to the older women, it says here, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So this is not just widows. This is saying that the older women ought to teach young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So this is this same concept where the adversary can speak reproachfully. The word of God can be blasphemed because young women are not loving their husbands, not loving their children, not being keepers at home. Now it's almost like this exhortation to young women, to old women, assumes that young women will be getting married. You know, because it's not saying that they'll teach the young women to get married. It just says that they'll teach the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. It's, it's sort of like the assumption is built in that, hey, they will be married. They will be seeking children because that's the, the will of God for a young woman. Um, also, if we go, just go back quickly, um, 1 Timothy 5. We can see here that raising children is a good work that must be done for a widow to even be taken on by the church. It says here, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. And look at what is listed first. If she have brought up children. So I think it lines up with the fact that the will of God is for a young woman to marry, bear children, guide the house, and it doesn't just uh, apply to women that have been married and their husband has passed away. Now, of course, the exception in 1 Corinthians 7 is somebody that has the gift of being single, you know, where they do not struggle with the lust and they've decided to forego that in order to serve God. Now, I don't think that is a, is a sin um, for somebody to not be married because obviously Jesus Christ was not married. If it was a sin not to be married, then Jesus Christ would have been in sin. But for those that don't struggle, you can go back and read in 1 Corinthians 7, if you don't struggle and burn with lust, then um, that could be something for you. But I'd say that's not the norm. <clears throat> now, in this passage, we can see that there are three aspects to the verse. I will therefore that the younger women marry. So that's becoming a wife to a man. They bear children. That's becoming a mother. And then they guide the house. So guiding the house is the responsibilities that a mother takes on in terms of raising the children and taking care of the home. Now, bearing children is the, is the, is the easier part, right? I mean, generally, you know, it's, it's a bit more exciting to actually do as well, um, to, 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 to create children and bear children. Obviously, actually giving birth to them is hard work when, when a lady goes through labor. But... Becoming a mother is quite easy, but even that is under attack these days where people do not value children. That's sort of what I want to touch on today. And the other side of it is, you know, guiding the house, being a mother and your responsibilities. Now, like I said, both, both of these aspects I find are under attack today because it's an effective way for, for Satan to disable Christianity. Because think about it, right? If he can convince Christians not to even have children, then he doesn't have to kill Christians because Christians are just going to kill themselves. Um, and it's an interesting thing. I want to show you this video actually um, about overpopulation because I mean, we talk about having a lot of children. How many times do you hear people say, well, isn't the world overpopulated? It, it, uh, people are having too many children. But that's not actually true. And I wanted to show you this video. I think it's, um, oh, I think I accidentally closed it. And it's just a two-minute video and it talks about the myth of overpopulation. You might have seen it before, but I just think it explains it really quickly and, and really well. From the time of the cavemen all the way until today, humanity continues to exist because each generation of people has produced another generation to replace itself. Scientists have figured out how many people need to be born each generation to replace the generation before. That number is one person per person. All things being equal, this creates perfect demographic balance. Since women are the only ones who can have children, replacing every person on Earth means each woman needs to have two children. One to replace her, and the other to replace the man who cannot have children. The total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a society is having. This number shows us if a society is growing or shrinking. 
in developed countries, the replacement rate birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. This will keep the population stable, but even that is assuming that every woman has children and that there are no wars, famines, or disease. In the real world, disasters happen all the time, and sadly, not all children reach adulthood, especially in poor countries. This pushes their replacement rate up to 3.3 children per woman. Since not every woman wants to have children, in order to keep the population stable, some women need to have more than 2.1 children to balance the birth rate with the women who are only having one or no children at all. Maintaining this balance is of the utmost importance. If society does not at least replace itself every generation, human numbers begin to fall exponentially. Economic and social problems appear as elderly people retiring begin to outnumber young people entering the workplace. But this is already happening all over the developed world. Many of the world's nations are only barely replacing themselves, while a growing majority have birth rates below replacement, some as low as 1.8 or even 1.2 babies per woman. Many societies are facing a very real danger. Extinction. I, I, sorry, I, I just got I just got a message from Ozzy saying a baby girl. I was just asking whether it was uh, whether it ended up being natural or not. So um, yeah, thank God for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what was the point I was trying to make there? So see, you see how it's it's interesting here that these videos talk about overpopulation being a myth, and you actually have to have at least everyone has to have at least two children in order for the population to even be stable. So when it talks, so when people are not having children, you saw Australia, I think on that graph, I, mean, I don't know where they get their data from, but it was less than two. So you wonder why places like Canterbury, Bankstown, Lakemba, why they're just being overrun with Muslims. It's not because they're converting people to Islam, it's because your average Muslim family is having three or four children. I mean, after a few generations, there's gonna be Muslims in the area. So, you know, you, that, that's one of the reasons why maybe there are so few Christians these days, because Christians have gone the way of the world. They're not having children anymore. They don't value children. And they're only having maybe one or two children. So their population is going to decrease because two is not enough even to keep it, keep it, um, keep it stable. I think it's funny as well that, uh, you know, he, he, I don't know if you caught the joke in the video, he says, you know, scientists have figured out the number where you need to have a stable population. It's like one person per person. <laughs> it's like you just need to replace them, otherwise it's not going to be stable. Uh, I just thought that was funny. So you see, if, if Satan can get you to believe that children are not valuable, not to have children, he doesn't need to kill Christians, because Christians will kill themselves by just not having children. Um, and the other, the other aspect is Satan doesn't need to kill Christians if he can raise and, tra and train their children um, to not have children. So uh, look at what it says here in Deuteronomy 4 from 5. It says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So he's saying keep the commandments and do them. Because see, what is the use of commandments if we don't do them? What's the use of a commandment to be fruitful and multiply if we don't do it? You know, it's not going to have its desired effect. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I have set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So you see here that God has given, us a, given them a law and he says, hey, you need to do it. You need to take heed to yourself and keep thy soul diligently because what use is a perfect law if you don't do it? But also, what use is a perfect law if you don't teach it to your children? You know, if you don't raise your children to keep the law, hey, one generation's gone and the commandment is going to be of no effect. 
So it's very important that it's not just about becoming a mother, it's also about being a mother. Um, but I'm going to touch more on the becoming a mother first, because obviously you can't be a mother if you don't become a mother first. <sighs> now when people think of motherhood, generally when people think of motherhood, and probably not in this church obviously, because most of us see motherhood the right way, as in a calling of God, and, and as something of value to do. But you know, when you, t when you talk to ladies and when you hear ladies talking about motherhood, generally it's just something that they would like to do in their life. You know, it's kind of like a holiday. Like, you know, one day I want to go see, you know, Cancun and I want to go sit on the beach. It's something I want to do, but just as something as in passing, an experience I want to have. As opposed to something they want to be. You know, like motherhood ought not to just be something you want to do in your life, a passing phase. It ought to be something you want to be, um, a calling of God. And, you know, it's funny when people, you, you tell people, you know, you're a housewife or you're a homekeeper. And people will say, oh, you're just a housewife. You're just a homekeeper. You know, like when they say, what do you do for a living? Oh, you keep the home. Oh, it's like, oh, you're just a housewife. And I find that phrase funny because the same people that will say things like that, just a housewife, just a homekeeper, they're also the ones that realize how hard it is. You know, like you talk to the ladies at work, you talk to the ladies out in the workforce or out and about, and you tell them, well, I have four children, I have five children, I've got two children. And they're just like, oh, yeah, I had children. It was just so hard. It was so difficult. You know, they might have one child or two children and, you know, it was so hard for them. That's why they put their kid in daycare and they, and they, and they had to go to work. So I think it's funny. It's sort of like an oxymoron that even though the world will say things like you're just a housewife, they also recognize how difficult it is to actually be a mother, and that's why a lot of them actually prefer not to stay home, to send them to daycare, to send them to school, because they don't feel qualified to actually do it. You know, how many people do you talk to? You say, well, you know, I homeschool my children, I'm planning on homeschooling my children, and they say, well, are you, are you qualified? Are you? So they obviously think it's a, it's a daunting task to do if they're outsourcing the responsibility. But yet they'll just say, oh, you're just a housewife, you're just a mother. Um, no, I, I don't think you're just a housewife. I think you're, you're fulfilling something that is more valuable than, than anything in the world. Um, you know, and this is why people don't have a lot of children, because they know it's difficult. You know, when I tell people at work I have four children, without fail, their jaw drops and they just cannot believe it. They're like, how are you keeping things together? And then I tell them my oldest is five years old or attorney five years old and their jaw drops again. Like, how can they just be so close together? How are you st still like... But you know, it's partly because they, they probably have taken to this whole philosophy of positive parenting. They don't spank their children. They don't discipline their children. So they find it a lot harder than it needs to be. So they th say things like just because, they're, because it's a payless job. But then, is that how we get our worth? Is that, is that how we value things? Just how much somebody's willing to pay you for it? You know, are we not, do we not see past the temporary? Um, you know, some people, some ladies will say, you know, my children don't let me accomplish anything. But taking care of your children is the accomplishment. You know, sometimes you want to get things done through the day. Like, my wife sometimes will feel like that. She'll say, like, I don't feel like I did anything today. But you kept the children alive. You fed them. You, that, that was the accomplishment. You know, you survived another day. You know, that, that is what you're accomplishing. Um, don't forget that. Uh, let's go to Mark 8. That's 36. The Bible says here, For what shall it profit a man if he gain... If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, obviously, the Bible talking here about salvation, but we see here the principle that your soul is worth more than all the riches in the world. The Bible says here, what, what are you advantaged? It says in Luke. It says here, what shall it profit a man? See, what have you gained if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? So we see here that a soul is more valuable than all the riches in the world. So when you have children, what you are now responsible for is more valuable than anything that you can attain. Um, you know, this applies to men also. You know, obviously men need to recognize um, the value of children. But 
I feel more so that this is a reminder for women because, you know, because men are working every day, you, you come home and generally when you're distant from something, you value them a bit more. You're a bit more happy to see them. But ladies are at home day in and day out and they're seeing their children every day. I, I find even my wife, she'll, you know, she'll say things like, you know, that we don't, people comment about how cute our children are. Well, we sometimes don't see them as cute as you see them because we see the sin, we see the naughtiness and things like that. And sometimes mothers more so need to be reminded of the value of their job, the value of their children because they see them day in and day out and they start to think, oh man, I wish I was doing something else. But they need to be reminded that what they're doing is the most valuable thing that they could be doing. So children are valuable. But sometimes you need to hear that because it's really easy to forget. You know, I think of the example of an account manager because, you know, I work in, a, in a, most, most business where I have sales people, I worked in sales. Um, you know, an account manager, generally the seniority of an account manager is measured by the size of their portfolio. You know, gen generally the account managers that get paid more, you know, their portfolio, which means the value of spend amongst their clientele is in, you know, maybe in the millions or in the billions of dollars or something like that. Or, you know, and then the lesser account managers have less value accounts. Now, if we wanted to price up a mother's role and you have children that are worth more than everything in the world, I mean, whose role is more valuable? An account manager that has millions and millions of dollars in a portfolio or a mother that has one child? So we need to change our perspective in how we see the job of a mother. You know, a mother's job is more valuable than any... Um, account managers role and how much um, they have in their portfolio. And likewise, when you think of an account manager, uh, account manager, do you think an account manager is doing a smart thing if they spent all their time on the non-spending accounts? Let's say, let's say you had an account manager that had 20 accounts and 10 accounts spent no money at all. But that's where they spent all their time. It didn't give them any returns, had no value, but that's where they wanted to spend their time. Do you think that's a wise thing to do? Wouldn't the account manager spend time on the accounts that actually bring him a profit, actually bring some gain? Yeah, Ashley, if you just want to help them find a seat. This is what I think about mothers that neglect their responsibilities. Mothers that neglect, you know, taking care of their children because they're neglecting what is valuable for what is not valuable. You know, they want to spend their time doing things that are going to be burnt up, that are going to be done away with, but they're neglecting their children, which is something that is the most valuable. Now let's just go back to 1 Timothy 5.14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now this, this, this passage here, it, it's a statement of liberation. You know, often we'll read this and they'll say, oh, you know, Christianity is just trying to oppress women. It's just trying to keep them in the home. But with the right frame of mind, if we value children, if we value the role of a mother, this is not actually a statement of oppression, but it's actually a statement of liberation. Because it's directing women to do things that actually matter. It's directing women to do things that actually have some value in life, more value, rather than spending their life doing things of little value. Now let's just read this in context. Look at what it says here. But the younger women, younger widows refuse, for they... For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So we can see here, because of these activities, this is the reason why God wants women to be busy with marriage, with children, with guiding the house, because otherwise they become idle. They wander about from house to house and they become tattlers and busybodies. Now you might say, well, a woman that's not married, that's not what she's doing. She's, you know, she's at work and she's uh, you know, making a you know, living and she's got a job and things like that. And you know, there might be some women that are just really focused on their job and I would say that's not really something of value because you'd rather be focusing on, on children rather than focusing on a career. But even so, I find even in my own workplace, most women do fit this category even though they're at work. Because you go along, you know, in my work, you know, you go along to the meetings 
and they're so unprofitable sometimes and the meetings sometimes are just they go along and they just chit chat and they're just catching up and it reminds me of this you know they're not wandering from house to house but they're just wandering from meeting room to meeting room and chatting with each other and they're just being idle because they're just trying to figure out how little they can do until they can go home or go out to the coffee shop with their friends and and nowadays it's not the tattlers and busybodies house to house it's the tattlers and busybodies on social media because women that are not busy raising children and guiding the house, you know, they get on the Instagram, they get on the Facebook, and they're all chit-chatting about things and just being busybodies and tattlers. So it's funny that there's nothing, it's almost like there's nothing new under the sun. You know, back then they're going house to house, now they're just going from phone to phone being tattlers and busybodies um, because they're not busy doing what they ought to be doing. And as mothers, you know, we need to be careful, and even as parents, we need to be careful not to be carried away with social media that we neglect our children. I think about this funny comic that um, my wife was explaining to me where, you know, you have those one picture comics and it was like the picture of a mom like on her computer and her children are calling her and she's like, she's like, wait, wait, I'm telling everybody how much I love you. <laughs> while, while her children are being neglected. I just thought it was, it was so funny because on, you know, on Facebook people advertise how much they love their family, how much they love their children. How do they have so much time to sp spend writing blog posts and, and doing all these things? I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of time taking care of children. Let's look at a couple of verses that talk about children in the Bible. Um, just see the positive nature of having children. And we already sort of touched on 1 Timothy 5.10 where we see here that this is a good work when we have to decide, do we take this woman that is over 60 years old and, and put her on the payroll of a church? It says here she needs to be well reported of for good works if she had brought up children, if she has loved strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet. And, and so on and so forth. So one of the requirements is that you raise children and that's a good work. Let's go to Genesis 1.26. One of the initial intentions of, of, of God for man was to be fruitful and multiply. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I just want to note there that it's interesting that only man is created in God's image um, and not the female. You can see there. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, singular, not them. Male and female created he them. So a lot of people think that Man being created in the image of God is a fact that we're a three-part being. I don't think so. I think man being created in the image of God is just that, is that we look like a man and God is a man. And that's why man is created in the image of God and woman is not created in the image of God because God is a man and a woman's not a man. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we see here that having children is one of the initial intentions that God had Format. Let's go to Psalm 127, reading from verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So we see here that children are a reward. Um, they're not, they are a blessing, but they're a reward because I believe it's about reaping and sowing. And I'm not going to probably get into that this sermon. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Happy. So children are, are a blessing. They're a reward. They're an heritage from the Lord. They're something you ought to want to have. Um, they ought to make you happy. This is the frame of mind we should have with children. They ought not, you ought not to think of them as a burden or something to, to avoid. They should be something that you should be striving for. Um, let's go to Deuteronomy. Uh, 28. I wanted to show you this verse here. So we read this morning in our Bible reading um, about it as well, the blessings and, and cursings in the Old Testament. But in Deuteronomy 28, uh, it goes over here, the blessings, and the, the later part of the chapter goes over the curses. It says here, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to, to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, 
And blessed shalt thou be in the field. And look at this. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. And it goes on about the blessings. Now let me ask you, if, if God blesses in the Old Testament the people, the children of Israel, for keeping His commandments by giving them more children, why would we seek to want the curse of God? Because the curse would be to not have children. So you see, why would you seek the curse? Why would you not want to seek the blessing? This is the mindset we ought to have when it comes to children. So obviously the Bible speaks very positively about children. It, it, it ascribes great value to them. It ascribes great happiness. It's something we ought to be seeking. So it's a really ungodly attitude for somebody to say, I don't want children. Children is something that I should not want. They're a burden. I would rather do this than have children. That is not the attitude that God wants us to have. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, that everyone is going to have children because there are different factors there. But we all ought to have the mindset that children are of value and that we want as many as we can. Now, I'll just finish on some other relevant questions and we'll end it there. But one question people will ask is, well, how many children should I have? Well, I don't think the Bible actually ascribes an answer. The you know, Bible talks about being fruitful and multiplying. The Bible talks about having your quiver full. So it ought to be the most that you can have. But you want to think of the question like this. You know, if I had, let's say, an abundance of gold coins, you know, one ounce coins, they're worth about 1700 bucks right now, it's almost 1800 I was kicking myself because I wanted to, to buy some for my kids. And then it jumped from like 1600 Like in the last week, it jumped from 1600 to like almost 1800 there was a spike and I was like, damn it. But anyway, so let's say I had like an abundance of gold coins and I asked you the question, well, how many would you like? You'd probably say, well, how many do you have to give me? Right? Like give me as many as you can. Like if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're free, then, then give them to me. Now, obviously children are not free. They do take some work. But the principle is still the same. If there's, if there's something of high value, why would you put a limit on how many you would want? I mean, if I was to offer you money, you wouldn't put a limit on that. You'd say, well, I'd take as many as I can. Now, children are obviously more valuable than that. So why would you, not, why would you hold back? Um, now, we're no longer under the Old Testament, but why would you see a blessing of God as a burden? Um, you know, we saw the quiver full. We saw the be fruitful and multiply. You know, if, if God gives us a command to be fruitful and multiply, why would we not strive to do our best, to keep that as much as we can, to have as many children as possible? And the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, hey, have them young and have them straight away after marriage. Why? Because then you can have more. You know, if you wait until later on in life, it's a lot harder to get pregnant just because your body is becoming older. So when you have them later on in life, you're going to have less children because newsflash, children take time to make. You know, they have to bake for nine months and then you have to give birth to them and you can't just ha keep having them, you know, every nine months. You know, there's a time where the wife rests and she's not fertile again until maybe six months later if she's breastfeeding. So children take time to make. So start as early as possible. Um, and don't leave it till too late after, after you get married. Let's just go back to Psalm. I just want to bring up a point here. We just read this. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Now, I was pondering this verse and just thinking about it. And, and you know, Kevin preached on it as well and, and brought up some really good points. How, you know, we ought to be mighty men. The arrows, the, the, the effectiveness of the arrows are when the arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, just not the fact that you have arrows. Because if you have arrows and you don't know how to use them, they can actually do you damage, right? You know, it's like you see people that you try and shoot a bow and arrow and then it flicks back and hits them in the face or something like that. But I, what I was thinking about is it says it here, as arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Now, I think this is an exhortation to have children young, but I'm, I'm just thinking, why are arrows more effective or why are children more effective when you have them young? Well, it's because I... What I was thinking about is because children take time to train and to become effective, don't they? And when you have them too old, by the time your children come to the age where they're adults and you can send them out into the world and they can do some damage, you, 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 now you need to be taken care of. So I was having this idea that, well, when you have children young, when, you're, when your children are finally sharpened and honed and they get sent out into the world, you can then go fight with them.
So they're in your hand and you are in the battle together with the arrows in the hand of the mighty man. But when you have children so late, I find one, by the time they're grown up, now they need to take care of you. So it's sort of like taking away from some of their effectiveness. Whilst you could be out there in the battle with them, fighting with them, supporting maybe something that they're doing, now you're so old that all their energy has to now be spent taking care of you. So I was just having that thought that, you know, that's why maybe having children younger makes you more effective in the spiritual battle because you can actually fight with them um, as we fight Satan, fight this world. Now, obviously, having them young, you can have more. You know, you're going to have more energy as well. Sometimes people, you know, they, they leave children too, too late. And they don't have the same, you know, libido as they used to, you know, the same drive as they used to, to want to get together with their wife and thereby decreasing their chances of having children. Um, generally, when you're younger, you know, you're, you're more eager to, to go to bed with your wife and therefore it'll, it'll work in your favor rather than leaving it later and um, decreasing your chances. You know, you're never 100% ready to have children, so you may as well just do them young. Children will help you grow spiritually. They'll, they'll, they'll help you mature and help you become more responsible. So I think it's a good idea, rather than leaving it till later, that you have children young and you have them straight away, and then they'll help you in that growth. Now, I think I'll leave it there for today. I don't want to go on too long. I wanted to talk about reasons why people can't have children and also touch on the topic of birth control, but I think I'll leave that till, um, till next sermon. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, I just pray, Lord, that uh, your word is an encouragement to your people here. I pray, Lord, that you help us have the right perspective. And I pray, Lord... Um, that as people come week after week, that they're growing and learning. I uh, pray, Lord, that you help us be effective in our soul winning. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for this church. Pray that you continue to lead and guide us. We thank you for the news of the baby girl. And I, I believe I saw from Ozzy that it was a natural birth. So thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. And um, we pray, Lord, for a speedy recovery um, for, for Rachel. And pray, Lord, that she would be the godly mother that you've called her, called her to be. Um, we love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.